Hi, everyone. Can you hear me quite? Yeah, uh, thanks for coming, despite this horrible, horrible title. Um, what are we going to be talking about today? So you might be wondering, why are we talking about uh, uh, memory usage when memory is abound, memory is really uh, quite cheap, especially given, uh, given the cloud and how it scales and how it's uh, progressively getting uh, less expensive, CPUs are fast and, uh, and all, the, uh, all that stuff. But um, uh, fun fact, you can get terabytes of memory on a single machine on AWS, so it might, it might be a non-issue. But um, there's a few things, uh, there's a few reasons why I want to talk about this topic. One is, whilst memory is cheap, it's not actually free. Uh, it can be a bottleneck, especially in some uh, performance-critical software. Uh, data locality matters, meaning that having a terabyte of data on S3 or on HDFS or on your local disk is something different than having it in memory or in a CPU cache. Well, not a terabyte of memory, obviously. Uh, so that, that matters quite a lot. And uh, last but not least, why should we waste space if it's uh, cheap and easy uh, not to? So uh, let's start by something, doing something fairly basic, uh, but something that might be a bit uh, too low level. And just, uh, we're going to be using individual bits in our bytes to store a Boolean value, so true and false values, which might sound like not a great idea, but it turns out it's not that bad. So um, to see how we can do this, uh, let's imagine that, well, not imagine, let's have a number, in this case, 109, and uh, let's look at the, uh, the bit representation. How does it look like if we look at the, at the number as it's stored in, um, in a memory in a computer? So it's just a collection of, uh, of uh, ones and zeros. And um, here it uh, leverages the fact that we can take any positive integer and we can decompose it as a sum of distinct uh, sums of two. So that's the base two representation. So 109 is two to the power of zero plus two to the power of two, three, five, and six. And that's what the, uh, the ones in the, in the byte represent. So the, so the zero is we don't have that power of two whilst uh, the, the red ones, so the, so, uh, so the red bits, the, the ones, are that we're actually taking this power of two to, to get, our, uh, get our number. So this is how, how uh, the value of 109 is represented, and you could scale that out to, uh, you know, you had 16-bit numbers, 32-bit numbers, 64-bit numbers. That just varies by the number of uh, bits that you're using, and it also defines how big of a range of, a numbers, uh, of numbers you can represent. So if we look at the number and the, and the, uh, and the bit representation of it, we can, we can look at it two ways. Either we can say, okay, so this is 109, uh, that's a fine number, that's, that's one piece of information, or we can look at it as eight distinct pieces of information. So these are eight values, true and false, that we can uh, squish into this uh, tiny representation of a single byte. So, uh, so that means that we can take, let's say, a megabyte of memory, so that's a, a more or less a million bytes, and we can store 8 million bits of information in that. So a single megabyte of memory can, can let us know true or false information about 8 million uh, pieces, of pieces, of, uh, pieces of data. So <clears throat> that's why it's used, for example, in, uh, in some implementations, uh, implementations of data frames, or if you have a Boolean series that you actually want to store true and false values uh, in some column, you can, you can uh, serialize this in, this in this very condensed matter in these individual bits. So it's, uh, it's very efficient, especially for, uh, for random access. It's very efficient in terms of how small it is so it can fit into your memory if it's uh, small enough. It's, uh, it's very scalable because you only need one bit of information per, uh, per unit of data. Uh, it's trivially serializable because it's already serialized because it's just, it just raw, uh, raw bytes. And it has uh, various use cases. I just uh, included a few. So you can, for example, just store filter results. So if you're filtering some data, then you want to store which rows match that filter. So you can store it in a, in a, in a, in a large bitmap, just denoting one where the row matched and zero where it didn't. And then you can combine these individual filters if you want to do some sort of a combined filtering. And you can save these filter, uh, these, uh, filter results uh, locally because it's such a, it's such a small piece of data, uh, but representing quite a large uh, amount of information. So this is all well and good, but uh, what is the catch, or why why are we not using bitmaps for for everything? So the main so one of the main reasons is that it's not very good for sparse data. But spar and by sparse data, I mean something like uh, it's very similar to the way that we 
uh, represent sparse matrices. If you, if you have a matrix of thousand by thousand values, but only two of them are non-zero, or three of them are non-zero, you're not going to be saving one million individual numbers just to represent all, of, all, of all but two or all but three as zeros, because that's, that's just a waste of space, and it's also slow to access the non-zero values, etc. So that's the same with bitmaps. So let's say you've got a bitmap that will tell you uh, filter results for a data frame with a million rows, and only two rows are matching. So you still need to allocate a million bits. So what is it, 120 kilobytes or something, uh, only to denote that, hey, row one and row 990,512 uh, is, uh, is actually set. So that's the, that's the main disadvantage of bitmaps. They are still crucial and they're still very useful for, uh, for a smaller, uh, smaller piece of data. So if you know that you've got, let's say, 16 or, uh, or 24, or some, some smaller number of values they need to save, for example, uh, many times, then they are, they are still useful, but once you get into these larger bitmaps where you've got uh, a sparsity of information, then that's where they show their weakness. Uh, there is a solution to that, so there's, uh, there's a few compression algorithms. It's not like you take the, the byte array and just compress it using gzip or lz4 or something like that. Uh, there's compression mechanisms similar to what you would find in col columnar databases where you just take, oh, here's a one that's repeated 100 times, so instead of saving 100 once, I'm going to save the number 100, and then that's going to denote here is, a, here is a run of 100 ones. And there's a few, few of these uh, compression mechanisms which basically allow you to compress these, uh, these bitmaps, and s that's why uh, tools like uh, Lucent is the uh, the searching technology behind uh, Solar and Elasticsearch or HiveSpark and other uh, software that we use in, uh, in the big data sphere are using these compressed bitmaps if, because if they represented the true-false um, arrays explicitly in, in bitmaps that would take uh, a lot of space that would be really uh, expensive to send over the network or, or a retrieve from memory or disk. So I'm not going to go through the through the compression mechanisms, but there's a few. One of the most popular ones uh, is a fairly recent one of uh, roaring bitmaps. So now that we have uh, now that we have bitmaps, what can we what can we do with them? So the uh, the rest of the talk, I'm going to cover two uh, two more data structures that are quite useful in uh, in data engineering or data work in general. The first one is a bloom filter. So what a bloom filter does, it's um, just to preempt it, this is a probabilistic uh, data structure, uh, and that means that uh, it doesn't give you exact answers, which might sound odd. That why would you save something that you can't retrieve uh, one for one? But it's going to make sense in a in a minute. So the way uh, so the way it works is that it gives you two kinds of answers. Uh, so so you sorry so you treat it as a set. So it's a set of values. So you've got a set of values. Let's say you've got a uh, caching service and you want to cache, uh, cache a million objects and you want to uh, see which objects you've cached. So you could represent this as, you know, you would save all the individual keys in some sort of a tree structure and uh, then you look it up, but then this data structure grows linearly with the, with the number of uh, keys that, you're, that you've got saved. What Bloom filters do, they, they allow you to have uh, a fixed piece of memory where you can save uh, set information and then you can query it and get two kinds of results. It's either going to give you, a, uh, it's either going to tell you, yeah, this this uh, this field is maybe in this in this set, or it's going to tell you it's definitely not in the set. And those are the the, the two only answers that you can get, and uh, you can tune how um, how accurate it's going to be, and that's basically the the, the length of it. Um, so the way it works is that we hash, uh, so we hash each value that we want to save in this uh, in this um, uh, bloom filter and we store it so that's the <laughs> that's the short and so let's let's look at a uh, a better representation so here we've allocated uh two bytes of memory so we've got 16 bits here uh, down here and uh, we want to insert a value so uh the first catch is that we're not, not only going to be using one hash function we're going to be using two uh, in reality we could be using uh, six or seven where well, we're going to get to that so we've got two hash functions hash one hash two so uh, we want to insert the value doc, so we're going to hash doc, and it's going to just imagine that it's modulo 16. Uh, it's not really important. Uh, we're going to hash it once, it's going to get value of 3. There we go. That's as much interaction as you're going to get today. Uh, uh, we're going to hash it again, we're going to get the value of 15, so we're going to set these two bits. Then we're going to get a second value, cat, we're going to hash it once, uh, it's going to give us value 1. Hash it again, it's going to get a, oh, get us 15. 
we've already got that set, so we don't have to do anything with that. Um, and then it's query time. We've got a, our large data structure, so let's see what we've got in it. So let's say somebody else comes to this uh, balloon filter and asks, is rabbit in this set? So they hash it with the, with the first hash function. They got the value of four, and they can immediately stop because, as you can see, the bit number four is not set. So there's no way that somebody could have uh, inputted rabbit into this set because otherwise that bit would have been set. Uh, if they ask, if, is horse in our set? Oh, yeah, I changed the size today just so that I could fit it in one line, and I forgot to change that horse. So let's imagine that's an ant. So we hash it once. Uh, we got a one that's set. Uh, we hash it again. Uh, that's 12. That's not set, so, uh, so we can abandon it uh, only after the second hash function. And the third example, and that's the, uh, that's the crucial one, if we uh, hash the value of owl once, get 15, hash it again, get a one. Uh, so we, might, we, we would say, yes, owl is possibly in our set, but as you can see, it's a false positive because we never uh, inserted this, uh, this uh, value in our bloom filter. So that, that basically covers all the, uh, all, the, all, the, all the things that can happen when you're uh, inserting data into the bloom filter and then querying them back from it. Uh, so you might be asking, well, isn't this sort of false positive rate uh, kind of a bad thing? Well, it kind of is, but you can, it, you can mitigate it by just allocating more than two bytes of memory usually and, um, and by having more, more hash functions. You still need to be sort of aware of how many unique values you're going to be inserting into that, uh, into that bloom filter. But once you've got this set, there's a few calculators online where you can just input how many distinct values you're expecting to input, uh, what sort of false positive rate uh, you want to you wanna, uh, you wanna have, and it's going to tell you, oh, use six, hacks, six independent hash functions and uh, 100 megabytes of memory or something like that. So, uh, so, so that's, what, that's what happens in practice with a large chunk of memory, more hash functions. And just to give you an idea of uh, where it's used, because it's such a small data structure, and it's really, really fast to uh, interrogate. So you only need to hash a value a few times, which uh, uh, um, a hash of a, of a value, you can do that millions of, millions of times per second per core. So, so it's really cheap. So it's often used as a sort of a buffer between your program and some sort of a remote storage. You can think of it as like a database or S3 or some, some other remote thing, which could take milliseconds or even more to query, so you might have that buffer of the bloom filter where you would ask, is this, have we ever seen this thing? Do we have this in our database? And uh, if you've got it tuned well, it can, it can return. If it, re if it says no, then you, you know for sure that it's, uh, that it's not in our database, so you don't have to worry about uh, querying, it, querying it. But if it says yes, then you double check, and then that's the only way, that's the only reason why you, you, would, um, uh, you would go there. So that's the, uh, that's the bloom filter in essence in, in, in in practice, it also is very useful if you've got a large sort of matrix of data. So for example, Medium uses it for um, article recommendations. So instead of saving all of the articles per user, so the IDs of all the articles that each user has read, they save a bloom filter per user, so which they can interrogate instead of interrogating the whole um, list of articles, which, which just grows over time, whereas the bloom filter just stays, uh, stays constant. So that was the first uh, probabilistic data structure. The second one, and very, I would say aptly named, but it's just weirdly named, um, it's called Hyperlog Log. It's, uh, it's got more or less one use case. Um, it's used for a distributed distinct count, uh, distinct count and again, it's proximate, it's a, it's a probabilistic data structure. Um, and it does exactly that and nothing more, well, not really anything else. Uh, you might ask, like, why, why, is it, why is this useful? But if you look at, for example, Presto from Facebook or uh, Spark or Redshift, if you do count distinct and look at the docs, it says, yeah, this is count distinct because it gives you the exact number of uh, distinct values. But then next to it, the, they have an approx distinct count, which uses hyperlog log in the background, and it gives you approximate distinct count whilst not using, uh, using as much memory. And it could make a difference of, hours in terms of uh, query runtime, you could, uh, and it also ha makes a huge difference in terms of memory usage, which we're gonna uh, touch, because I'm, using, I'm saying extremely little memory, it's, uh, it's kilobytes of memory to, uh, to estimate cardinalities, cardinalities of billions of values, so you, can, so you could be spending uh, uh, gigabytes or dozens of gigabytes of memory to calculate the 
the exact distant count, whereas with the hyperlog log, you, you could uh, you could say within the margin of two, four percent, something like that. I can tell you uh, the distant count and use it, use only a few kilobytes of memory. Again, it's probabilistic. So how does it work? So we hash each value. We look at the number of uh, leading zeros in that uh, byte representation. We track the maximum of these of the number of of, uh, of zeros. Then there's some magic that happens, and then we get the cardinality. So, um, what is that magic? Um, so the so the key observation that uh, the authors of the hyperlog log, or formerly the the log log uh, algorithm, uh, had was that if you hash a value, which returns a random but deterministic uh, hash value. Um, there's, a, there's a distinct property of the number of, uh, of leading zeros in that hash. Um, because he, if, if we look at it, this is, this is, uh, these are all the combinations of uh, a of four-bit, let's say we've got a four-bit uh, hash function, which is not very useful because it only gives you uh, 16, uh, 16 different values. If we look at the leading, leading zero, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we've got eight values which don't have any leading zeros, then four which have one, two which have two, et cetera. So uh, because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a basic representation of a, of a random number, it's going to have this property of um, two to the power of k of uh, leading zeros. And uh, we can leverage that. Uh, let's look at another example. So let's say we're in certain in certain uh, different values into our into our hyperlog log. So we're going to take a dog, we're going to hash it with our uh, trivial uh, hash function. We're going to have one leading zero, so we're going to track that we've seen one uh, leading zero. Cat that doesn't have any, so the maximum is still one. I was going to increase that to two, and we're going to keep the two until the end because we didn't get any more than two. So by leveraging the stat st statistical property of the of the number of uh, leading zeros in in the hash function in the hash values that we've seen, we can estimate how many distinct values we've uh, we've seen in the in the data so far. Uh, there are two main issues with this. If we say, "Oh, we've seen six leading zeros," so I'm going to say two to the power six of distinct values. That's a fine estimate. Very wrong usually, but fine. Um, but then if you saw seven, you're going to say, oh, two to the power of seven, and you've got this, this gap, you can only estimate two to the power of k of distinct values, so 64, 128, then 256. It's never going to be really that, uh, that accurate. Uh, also, it's very susceptible to chance. So let's say, this is only a statistical property of the, leading, of the number of leading zeros in those, in those hash values, but w what if by chance you get 32 leading zeros and then you can say, ah, oh, there, there's been 4 billion distinct values and you've only seen two. Uh, so that could happen. So the solution to both of these problems is to use buckets. So if we look at the, if we look at the, the hash value again, so we, we saw the three leading zeros down there. Uh, we can look at the other side. Well, it doesn't really matter what's the implementation here. It differs. Sometimes you look at the same side, just shift it. Anyway, it's we look at the other side when you're going to say, oh, here's uh, uh, 0, 1, 0. So we're going uh, to look at the other side of the, of the hash value to get us some sort of a bucket. So we're going to look at the, the leading zeros, but we're going to assign it to, to different buckets. So we're going to say for all the hash values that we've seen that had the bucket uh, identification of 0, 1, 0, we're going to track a maximum for that one. Then we're going to track a maximum for, uh, for three zeros, et cetera. So since we're using three bits per bucket, then we're going to get eight, uh, eight different buckets. And then we can track these maxima per each bucket. And then we can average out the, uh, the distinct values uh, that we get for each bucket. So we've got any outliers. Even the, I think the original implementation had that you would just throw out the outliers because you had so many buckets. You could have like 2,000 buckets. So you're just going to throw out the, the outliers. Uh, the current one uses a harmonic mean to sort of smooth out these, uh, uh, these extremes. Uh, so, so you get what so you get what uh, what we wanted. So we shard, shard our data into these buckets based on some other bits. That's just a different side, a different part of the of the of the hash value. You keep the you do the same thing. You keep the uh, you keep track of the of the number of leading zeros uh, for each um, uh, for each bucket. You average out, average out not a simple average but a, a harmonic mean. Uh, then there's a few bias correction. Uh, uh, constants and then and then that's it 
and the and the number of charts or number of buckets determines how accurate it's going to be and uh, the usual, usually you'd use like 2,000 2, buckets, but since you're only tracking uh, the number of bits which you can say, which you can save in less than a byte, then it only take two kilobytes to save this this amount of information. And newer newer implementations are actually just using like six bits to to determine the uh, to, to track the maximum because that's uh, that's all you need. Uh, but that's just implementation detail. So. Uh, so what is it then? It's a it's an algorithm with a tiny memory footprint. It's got a tunable error rate. It can be updated, so you can just keep this uh, this set of buckets, this uh, these maxima, just keep it in memory, and just as data streams in, you're just going to keep updating the maxima if they if they are ever uh, ever changing, and then you can calculate the cardinality at any point. Um, since that's so small, you, you can have like a distinct count per. Let's say your article. If you've got a uh, if you've got a if you've got a news site, and uh, it's really easy to track how many readers have uh, have read it without storing the individual IDs or anything. Uh, it can also be merged, so you can have, and that's that's what brings the distributed part into the into the algorithm. So you can merge these uh, these estimates from uh, from multiple uh, from multiple uh, threads or even computers. So that's why. Uh, that, that's why the, the technologies like Presto or Spark are using it. They just shard the data and then uh, calculate the distributed uh, the, the count per each uh, per each shard, and then you just merge them together. And the merge is actually quite simple because you're just going to align the buckets and just take the maxima uh, from each pair. Uh, obviously, you need the same uh, the same length and same hash functions, but since it's the same implementation, you would uh, you would get that. There's a few extensions. I'm not going to uh, go over them. The Hyperlog Log One uh, Log Log Plus is uh, is mostly about improving the uh, the accuracy and, and lowering the, the the memory use, like it's too high or anything. Um, and the and then there's a few, there's a few other things where I think Hyperman Hash uh, allows for uh, intersections, etc. So um, that, that, there's been some research, but but the base the base algorithm is is decades old, just like uh, Bloom filter. Uh, Here's a slide that I've added today, so there's not much on it, uh, because I realized I don't have a good summary. Um, so what is it for? Um, it really does depend on what area you're in, what sort of position you're in. And um, so it could range from, oh, this is cool, I'm going to implement it just because I, I think the, the concepts are interesting, and I, and I recommend implementing all three because they're uh, they're quite interesting. It's a sort of in a, in a sort of increasing increasing complexity. Bit, uh, bitmaps are really really interesting by how easy they are to implement. Bloom filters are a bit uh, bit trickier, but it's still just bit fiddling, just modular and uh, and stuff like that. Hyperlog is a bit more involved because you've got all the sharding and the bias correction, etc. But there, it's a really good learning experience. So that's one thing. The other thing is that since they are used in uh, in quite a lot of software that we use for uh, for distributed computing, or not not just uh, distributed computing, even like uh, single node computing, it's quite good to know what sort of properties they have. So when you when you're using them, like the thing like the app uh, approx distinct, when you're running it, like why is it so efficient? Why is it so fast? Why is it why is it not uh, crashing without of memory? Uh, where is the source of the error? Is it sampling or is it doing something else? So. I uh, I have the mindset that I like to understand things that sound uh, sound strange. So hyperlog log sounded strange. So I wanted to know why it uh, why it works, uh, and you might even use it as a data structure yourself. So we uh, we've used uh, hyperlog a few times just to just to save these uh, these distinct values and just update update them over time. Uh, so uh, so that's that. There's many reasons why you might be interested. It might <laughs> there's many reasons why you might not be. Um, <laughs> Uh, and that's it. So there's a few uh, there's a few other resources that I that I found quite useful. Uh, there's a really good video from uh, CPPCon, which uh, is a C++, uh, C++ conference, but there's uh, not a lot of C++ in that video, and it's just got a great overview of uh, of uh, these algorithms and many more. Um, the uh, there's a whole family of probabilistic data structures that I would recommend you to to explore because it's not just about uh, about uh, sets in bloom filters and distinct values in in, in hyperlog logs, but there's also things like uh, hypermin sketch, which which allows you to 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 get a bit more information for for each uh, each value that you're inserting. 
uh, and, a, and a few other few other algorithms which give you approximate answers at very low memory uh, cost. And um, and yeah, that's it. <laughs>